This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Like just to remind you, because you are much more exposed to language, that music, uh, like speech, is very old, universal. We can discuss the fact that it is a human trait, maybe later, acquired very early and spontaneously. There is no specific tutoring to learn how to sing and how to respond to music. And what I'd like to stress is that it is multi-systemic. That is, there are multiple systems that are involved in our way to respond to music, like to speech. Uh, and uh, among those, uh, that is perception, learning, emotion, and action. But among those, I think that really the emotional system is the most important that best explains the ubiquity and utility of music. And, uh, but before I go into uh, the um, uh, emotional part, I'd like just to stress the way we study music. There, there was some uh, discussion about what it is art, and I'd like just to specify the way we study music uh, uh, and what I call the functional music. That it is, it is a music that is really intended for the majority, for everyday singing, for enjoyment of music. It is also appealing to uh, everyone, like uh, folk, jazz, uh, soundtracks of uh, films. It is also participatory most of the time. It's for dancing, for singing together. And also, it's often public and social. This kind of music has really little prestige. Uh, but it is, I believe, closer to the conditions under which most people in most cultures through history have interacted with music. So now I'd like to give you a glimpse at the emotional power of music. I'm pretty sure you all have your own idea of what kind of power it has on you. Uh, but I'd like just to give you a few facts, just to tell you that it is not magical. It is, there are scientific facts supporting this emotional power of music. So I will illustrate in medical context, in social and context, in personal context, in soundtracks of new movies, and also the side effects of this, uh, of this power on intelligence on, and on uh, cognitive recovery from stroke. And I will end uh, with the hypo current hypothesis regarding the evolutionary origins of this power. The first one is uh, uh, the idea that mu music really induces relaxation. In fact, we tested that in a lab with a classical situation of stress. Uh, I mean, we, uh, poor students, we stress them to give a speech uh, on a very obscure topic, very difficult topic in front of a committee, and we measure their cortisol every 10 minutes in the saliva. The cortisol is the stress hormone. And what w you can see here is that the usual reaction is here. If you can, yeah. Uh, here, it, is, it reaches a peak, which is very high, and then go down to baseline. But when you present music like this one, so what you can see is that it does decrease uh, the cortisol level compared to when there is no music. So the idea is, well, maybe this kind of music is distracting, especially when I'm speaking at the same time. <laughs> so we tested the idea in another situation, which is also quite known, is the situation that music can help you to reduce the sensation, the unpleasantness of pain. So the way we do that in the lab, we just uh, apply a, a term like this one, and usually not to the foot, but to the arm, and increase the temperature. 
and uh, the temperature can reach the 48.5 degrees represented here, and it's quite painful. And what we do at the same time, I mean, I'm not doing this kind of experiment, uh, <laughs> we present either uh, a, a pleasant music uh, that is with high arousal or uh, unpleasant music with equally high arousal. So it is, they are equally distracting. Let me, uh, very briefly, I promise. <laughs> And now the pleasant one. Okay, so what you can see is that with this kind of music, you do feel the, uh, less pain, that it is less unpleasant than when you have the, the other kind of music. And uh, it has been replicated in different situations, and what we know is that listening to music does decrease pain by 10 to 30%. So you know what to do when you are going to the dentist next time. Also, there are other situations when we know that music is activating uh, similar brain structures as other euphoria-inducing stimuli. So I'm happy to hear that love, uh, well, it's exactly the same region that we, uh, Helen Fisher was referring to with uh, a romantic love. That is, how it was done, it was uh, they asked musicians to select the, the music that would uh, elicit cheers and they put them in the scanner, and uh, what they observe uh, with this kind of music. And what they observe is that as intensity of cheers that they could measure was in, were increasing, then they could observe more activation into those regions in the brain that are really related to reward and motivation, like the nucleus accumbens or the ventral striatum. And these same brain structures are also involved in other euphoria-inducing euphoria stimuli like chocolate, romantic love, and cocaine. <laughs> but music is not only pleasure. Music also can induce anxiety and you only know it through the listening to the soundtrack. So just to, for you to, have, to remind you of what you experience in the uh, theater, this is without the soundtrack. So now you will appreciate. Can you put it low, please? don't need any data, but I will still give you a few facts. Uh, with, I mean, it's well known that one structure in the brain, a different one, of course, than the one we were concerning, concerned about uh, just uh, for pleasure, is the amygdala. This is an hormone uh, that is here in the limbic system, a very small structure that is known to be involved in all situations that are related to danger but it had never been uh, studied uh, in, with respect to music. So that's what we did. We test patients with damage to the amygdala, and we presented to them uh, clips, emotional clips like this one that are kind of well-controlled, and we know exactly what we are presenting. Just to give you an idea of how we test that in the lab or with patients. So this is supposed to express uh, anxiety, or s we call them scary clips, versus and this is more relaxing. 
And what we found is that uh, we found a selective deficit after damage to uh, this uh, specific structure, the amygdala, just for the scary music. In fact, they were confusing the scary clips with the uh, uh, peaceful one that I just presented to you. It was not due to a perceptual disorder. So these facts are just illustrating that music can act like other socially and biologically important stimuli. What I wanted to mention too is that it has side effects, it has cognitive benefits. And you certainly have heard about one of these, the Mozart effect. So let's imagine I present to you 10 minutes of this music. Not supposed to, to change in intensity, but for 10 minutes. And then I'll present this kind of task, the paper folding and cutting. It's a part of the uh, IQ testing. And I ask you to decide if it's A, B, C, D, or E. So it's not simple. And apparently after listening to Mozart, you do get an increase in the number of uh, problems you succeed to, to uh, solve relative to when it is uh, relative to silence. And if I present to you Albinoni, then it will decrease your performance re regarding to uh, silence. And you may think, all right, uh, this could, I mean, there, there has been a, a legend about Mozart that has uh, some uh, special effect on the on neurons or on networks, but in fact, it's just a mood effect. That is, the, the Mozart music makes you just feel better. Uh, relative to uh, uh, Dagio uh, Binoni, and that is, has been really uh, uh, documented with different kind of tests. Another situation in which really music can change your mood and as a side effect will have uh, cognitive benefits has been recently published or reported uh, by a Finnish group from uh, uh, Helsinki. What they did is that they uh, uh, took st uh, 60 stroke patients and assigned them randomly to either group that was listening to musical tapes, to stories, or nothing. I mean, they had their regular therapy. And they assessed them every, uh, one week after the treatment, three months after the treatment, and six months afterwards, while they, they had that continued intervention, either music, speech, language, or uh, uh, the regular, the conventional ones. And what they found that on most tasks, cognitive tasks, there was a benefit. So there was a benefit for the, the musical group, which is here, compared to the control and the language group. And in fact, it was mediated by a mood effect because on those mood questionnaires, you could document the fact that they were the less depressed patients. And why, of course? We would all want to know why. Why music has such a power on us? And uh, of course, Darwin did raise the issue before, before us. And uh, he, he really wrote that uh, music must be ranked among the most mysterious with which uh, he, I mean humans, uh, are endowed. And we, we did hear about all the hypotheses earlier. I'd just like to mention uh, a few of them that I think are, are very important. Uh, one, we, we really have to keep in mind that it might have no adaptive function at all, and that uh, music can be just associated by chance to an adaptive trait. And of course, one important one is language or speech. So it might be that music was associated to uh, speech and, uh, and survived in our sp species. Uh, this is a topic that is really under uh, intensive research uh, nowadays, and uh, there is a book that uh, will certainly increase research in the comparison between music and language, it's a book by uh, Annie Patel, uh, Music, Language, and the Brain. And uh, this is really the research that is going on in several labs. But we don't have an answer that is really clear that uh, these are two independent faculty. Another well-known uh, effect, and this time it's not uh, the beautiful one we had, something else, but it doesn't matter, music might have done everything there. Um, so the idea is really that 
Music virtuosity is hard to fake, it's very demanding, and is highly prized. So it does impress uh, musical partners, and, uh, and it might work for both sexes. I mean, uh, uh, male may, may impress uh, female by their musical talent, but female can attract partners by their musical talent as well. So, and surprisingly, this is a hypothesis that would be very easy to test in the lab, and has never been addressed yet, as far as I know. Another one that is uh, really the dominant view in our field is the group of skin selection hypothesis. The idea is really that music has a, a value for uh, a cohesive force for, for, for creating bonding uh, am among uh, members of the same group and, uh, and a, 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 sub, a, a way to articulate this kind of group selection is just to uh, realize that a, a given group is also mostly formed of kin, and so if you do protect, uh, if uh, music is really helping the, 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 the bonding, it does help your genes. And one really well-known effect, and, well and again, this has never been uh, tested, so uh, again, it's an invitation for uh, research, but what we really know is that ma maternal singing does uh, have an impact on uh, 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 the regulation of arousal in uh, the, the baby, the infant. I mean, it's well known that lullabies will soothe the baby to sleep and that play songs will just arouse their attention. So this has been uh, relatively well established, although the other hypothesis is really uh, remain to be tested. Of course, we cannot test the role of music in the past, but we can test the utility of music today. So, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>